Well, why, why Jack Welch? Two reasons, two things led me to write this book. The first was that before I joined the Climate Desk, I wrote the corner office column for the New York Times. And during the last five years, I interviewed hundreds and hundreds of CEOs. And during all those interviews, one name kept coming up, and it was Jack Welch. And that just bugged me, right? That was like, why is this guy who retired two decades ago living rent-free in the minds of these CEOs today? And so that, that bugged me. Then I came across a story that brought it all home. I was one of the two reporters at the New York Times that covered the Boeing crashes and the aftermath. And when we dug into Boeing, we started to understand that, yes, there was an engineering story that explained tragically why two 737 MAX crashed in a matter of five months, but that there was this deeper cultural story that something had happened to Boeing over the past 25 years. And when we started unpacking that story, it was also the story of Jack Welch. Three of his protégés had explicitly transformed Boeing to be a company that resembled Jack Welch's GE. And when I started going from there, I started finding his fingerprints all over today's economy. And when I started thinking about the inequality we face, the problems we have in our politics, in our society, so many of them went back to the moves he made as CEO of General Electric from 1981 to 2001. Uh, and, and just to remind people about the Boeing, and, and if I remember correctly, because this is, uh, you know, this is really relevant, it's, it seems to me, is that they did not want to invest when there was a change in uh, airports. They did not want to invest in, in completely reorienting where their um, their engines were on their planes because of the new walkways or something in, in, uh, in the airports, if I remember correctly. And so instead, they tried to do like a software uh, engineering sort of trick to it that made pilot error, I guess, or uh, or the, the software error that much more likely. But it was really just a, a way of avoiding long term investment. If Boeing started nickel and diming its engineers in the early 2000s, right after the first of these Jack Welch protégés took over. And Boeing was transformed from a company that was renowned for its pristine, perfect aeronautical engineering. Pilots would say, if it's not Boeing, I'm not going. They wouldn't fly other planes because you knew that Boeing planes were designed the best and built the best. And then they started nickel and diming these places. And you can see it in, as you said, some of the decisions they made around engineering. And you can see it in things like outsourcing. Boeing used to make something like 66% of the components on its airplanes. Under one of these Jack Welch protégés, that ratio flipped. And all of a sudden, they were outsourcing 66% of the parts. And the list goes on in the ways that Boeing was transformed by the Jack Welch playbook. All right, let's go back. Just you, you do a little bit of history of uh, of, of GE. Um, this is a company that's now, I guess, 140 years old, almost 130 years old. Uh, Thomas Edison founded it. At one point, um, there was something that they practiced called welfare capitalism. What what was that, and and who came up with that term? Well, that, what we're referring to there is really sort of the ethos that corporate America and, and companies well beyond GE embraced during much of the 20th century. You know, the, there, of course, was the Gilded Age. But after that, after the Depression, and really from the middle of the 20th century, right up until the 80s, when Jack Welch came on the scene, there was this sense, and I know it's like foreign language to us, among CEOs and among corporations, that it was incumbent upon them to take good care of their workers, that it was a good thing to do things like pay the government your taxes, that they wanted to make an effort to pay their suppliers a good fare for the goods and services they were uh, receiving. There was this sense that we were actually in it together. And that was reflected in phrases like welfare capitalism, was, which was a good thing in the minds of CEOs back then. And it was reflected in what was broadly known as the golden age of capitalism, where the wealth being created by corporations was actually widely distributed. They were paying their workers well. They were paying their taxes. They were trying to support other businesses because they understood that when everyone shares in the wealth, the whole country, the whole of society gets stronger. That obviously is not the world we live in today. And and we should also, you know, we we got to be careful to put an asterisk there because in terms of like sharing 
uh, that wealth. I mean, it was it is known as the Great Compression, that era where we had a flattening of uh, of things like wealth inequality. Uh, but there were huge um, segments of our population who were not uh, allowed to participate uh, in the same way, of course, um, uh, you know, largely black people and and, and other uh, uh, folks of color. Um, and, but, we have, and I note that in the book without question. I, I don't want to I don't want to oversimplify. This of is course, not, a, this is not Pollyannish here. All right. So um, one other thing happened in the early 80s, uh, which was the Reagan revolution. And this was the ascendance of um, of. Uh, Milton Friedman is is been on the scene for quite a while. He was sent down to um, uh, to to help Pinochet create a free market, uh, you know, uh, uh, heaven there. So, I mean, is Jack Welsh indicative of like, I mean, he feels like he he may have pioneered some of these things, but none of it seems to me none of what he could have done. Could he have done in a different era? It seems to me. Is that accurate? I think, I think there's truth to that. The argument I make is that Friedman and people like Friedrich Hayek, they laid the intellectual groundwork for this Welch revolution. And re recall, Milton Friedman famously wrote in the New York Times Magazine in 1971, a full 10 years before Jack Welch became CEO, that the social responsibility of business is to increase its profits. But no one acted upon it until Welch came along. No one had the combination of the, you know, the gumption to actually do it, the platform in uh, of a company like General Electric, which is widely admired as the most respected company in corporate America, and the power of you know a company that at one point represented a full percentage point of GDP. And it was only when Welch got to GE and started implementing some of these things that had sort of been in the zeitgeist, but essentially unrealized for so long, that so much of the rest of the economy started to go along. And yes, the Reagan revolution was happening at the same time. And Reaganomics was an enabler. You know, President Reagan, it was under his leadership, his SEC essentially changed the rule around buybacks in 1984, 85, was it, that unleashed this gusher of companies being able to legally manipulate their own stock. And who was the first CEO? to launch a major share buyback program. It was GE, Jack Welch in 1986 or 87, right when that law is struck, $10 billion straight to buybacks. No more to the workers, no more to the suppliers, forget the government, we're buying back our own stock in an effort to drive up our share price. And 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 uh, it, there was also a massive change in the way that we looked at antitrust during that time as well, uh, where where the Reagan administration adopted sort of the the, the Borkian version of this, and then and Jack Welsh, uh, I, I, there was there was a figure that was astonishing that the, in terms of how many companies he bought and sold, like on a, like on a monthly basis, one thousand deals during the time of his tenure. That's that's a major merger and acquisition every single week for 20 years. And of course, he did that in an effort to just boost the bottom line. He wanted he explicitly wanted GE to be the biggest, the most valuable company in the world. He knew he couldn't do that through organic growth. So he did it through inorganic growth, buying up companies far afield from its historical industrial roots and taking the company into areas like finance and media, which were, of course, much more subject to all sorts of uh, dangerous headwinds that would come back to bite the company later, and, of course, undermine GE's longstanding tradition of quality engineering and great relations with its workers. Uh, I, I mean, and, and let's be clear, too, on what he would do when he would buy these companies, because this is really a story of extraction, it seems to me. He buys a company, he basically sells off or eliminates or fires all of those divisions of the company that aren't explicitly the one that is either making money or is in somehow going to ha allow him to make more money so that he can vertically, vertically integrate it with existing companies that he has in the portfolio. So all you're doing is essentially um, you're extracting value out of these things and you're not really building anything, are you? I, he wasn't a builder, right? He wasn't an inventor. And, and if you look at, 
the record of innovation at GE during his tenure, there's precious little to point to. You know, the one real innovation that came out of GE in the 20 years he was there was CNBC, you know, ESPN for the stock market. It, it, there was very little emphasis placed on creating new things of value. Instead, it was much more a strategy of looking to do what, what one exec in the book described to me as the Pac-Man model. Just go and gobble up other companies. And as you said, absolutely, spit out and fire workers that are deemed not essential. He would say, fix it, close it, or sell it. And he also said, I want to be number one or number two in every industry we're in, which again speaks to that absolute lust for consolidation.